I started baking sourdough just over 10 years ago while I was working as a professional chef. Now, since then, I've transitioned into teaching sourdough baking and baking for private customers here in Greece. I have made a multitude of mistakes and I am still making plenty today. That's just part of the learning process. Now, I'm gonna share my three biggest mistakes in the hope that you can avoid them to give you the best chance of progressing as quickly as possible with your own sourdough baking. Right, so my first mistake came when I was creating my starter. It was floating, it passed that standard benchmark float test. It was even quadrupling in size. And yes, it was full of bubbles too. But just because a starter floats or even trebles or quadruples in volume, doesn't necessarily mean that it's ready to raise a decent loaf. Now, I don't have any pictures from my early disasters, but what I can show you is what happens when you use a starter too early. Now, this video is from a great home baker and she fell into exactly the same trap as me. And when you see holes like this inside the crumb, it is a clear sign that that starter is just too young. But you know what? After Mavi continued to feed this starter for just a few more weeks, this is the type of loaf that she was baking. Now this starter here is one I created a couple of months ago. And what you're seeing now is its progress on just day six. Now I continue to feed it for another eight days. And then on day 14, I baked my trusty reboot formula. Now while this is a pretty good loaf for a new starter, the fermentation process and the proving were sluggish to say the least. So if you're at the beginning of your sourdough journey and you're creating your very first starter or your crumb looks like a load of field mice have been nestled inside. Just take a deep breath. Give your starter at least 14 days before baking with it. Even then, just adjust your expectations according to the age of your starter. Don't get deterred at the beginning just because you're not baking the perfect loaf. And please remember, just because the starter passes the float test or triples in size or is super bubbly, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna raise a decent low. Patience, patience is the key. Now I'm gonna be sharing the entire process from creating a starter to baking your first loaf and using up the discard very soon on the channel. So for a long, long time, I believed that to bake a decent loaf of sourdough, you needed to use a super strong or high protein bread flour. In fact, in my videos and my recipes online, I make sure that I give you those protein details of the flour that I'm using. But that's not because you can't make sourdough with a different flour. It's just to be super transparent about how I achieved these results with this recipe formula and these ingredients. Now, while using strong bread flour obviously provides great results, it's really not the be all and end all. Maybe you can't buy bread flour at your local supermarket. And you know what, if you've ever bought flour from a local mill or milled your own flour at home, you'll know that in most cases, the flour's a lot softer. My mistake was ignoring the importance of balancing hydration. Instead, I'd get a high protein flour and then push that hydration up way too far, way exceeding the capabilities of the flour that I was using. Now, whether you're testing a new flour, coming up with a new flour blend or experimenting, for example, with ancient grains, the process that I'm gonna show you right now is easy and yields great results. So you'll need to get yourself a recipe calculator. You're more than welcome to use this one. It's completely free. I'll link to it down below. So you're gonna start by deciding how much dough you need to make. This, believe it or not, is another critical step and another one of my big mistakes, which we're gonna get onto in a second. Next, you're gonna decide how much leaven you want to use to inoculate your dough. Now we can add the flour or the blender flour that we're gonna be using. Now it's time to keep your ego in check. Don't let it get the better of you. Start with a hydration of 65%. Now you can use the recipe on the right hand side to test bake the formula. Keep that ego in check. Don't just bake it once and then knock the hydration up by five to 10%. Get used to working with that dough. Get used to the hydration and then gradually increase it by two to 3%. Then you simply rinse and repeat you've got the best possible chance of getting a decent loaf and avoiding complete disaster if you start at 65% and then gradually work up. If you start at 80 or 85% and work down, it's gonna cause you a lot more stress and frustration, I promise you. And just remember this, just because you see somebody else boasting a hydration of 90%, 
it doesn't mean that the flour that you're using has the capability of handling that quantity of water. The skill of the home baker isn't in using the highest hydration possible, higher than everybody else. It's about learning how much water your flour can actually handle and how to produce the best possible result for your formula. We use this process all the time in our community to experiment with new recipes and flour blends. I promise you it works. Now for years, I really didn't understand the importance of matching the dough weight to the proving basket that I was using, and my dough was consistently undersized. Now, this makes judging the proving stage a lot harder than it needs to be. And to be honest, it gave away a lot of potential volume in the loaf before it even started baking it. The problem is, if that the dough is too small for the basket, the chances of leaving it to prove for too long, so it comes up and fills the basket, are increased. This often results in an overproved dough, especially if you're following a video where you can see that the dough actually fills the basket by the end of the proving stage. Now the exact opposite is true if the dough is too big for the basket. It's going to reach the top before it has the chance to fully prove. Now let's say you get the proving stage right. You're probably still forfeiting potential volume in your loaf. Have a look at these loaves. They're both produced from the same bulk fermented dough. It was then divided and proved for the same amount of time, just in different sized baskets. So even though the process was the same for both of these loaves, you can see how much volume we lost just because one of the doughs was proved in a basket that was too big. So whenever you're creating your own formula or you're using somebody else's recipe, you need to make sure that you adjust the amount of dough to suit the basket you're using. Now all baskets vary in size, and in most cases, you're gonna to need to make a few kind of tweaks until you get the dough weight just right. But you know what? It really is worth the effort. Now as a general rule of thumb, the oval baskets that I use hold around 800 to 850 grams of dough. And these round bannetons hold about a kilo of dough. I'm gonna to link to these below just for your reference. Now these were my biggest mistakes, but I wanna know what your biggest mistakes are. Let me know below and I'll dive deeper in a follow-up video. That's it for today. Get out of here, get some baking done. I'll see you again very soon. Stay tuned.